I'd like to acknowledge the, that we're gathering today on the traditional lands of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to the Elders past, present and emerging. It is lovely to see so many of us gathered here today. Welcome. I'd especially like to welcome Monica Konchik, Consul General of the Republic of Poland. And Elizabeth Czechich. President of the Polish Community Council of Victoria. And on behalf of the ASPJ, we publicly like to wish our sincere congratulations on your recent 60th anniversary celebrations. We also welcome Sue Hample, OAM, co-president of the Melbourne Holocaust Museum, and congratulate her on the recent reopening and rebranding of the MHM. We also welcome Professor Leon Sterling, Professor of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne, and acknowledge his support and assistance in development of this project. I am Ezra May, President of the Australian Society of Polish Jews and their descendants, the ASPJs. The ASPJs statement of purpose is to preserve and promote the historical and cultural heritage of Jewish life in Poland and to foster understanding between current and future generations of the Polish and Jewish communities. They are ambitious and noble aims, yet ones, at least I think, we do well. The past two and a half years of COVID instability has led to some concerning trends, both domestically and internationally, and it is easy to become discouraged at the, as the world, at least in some parts, seems to have regressed with an apparent rise in intolerance, a return to ethno-nationalism, and a rejection of a lot of the goodwill built between different people and communities. However, perhaps optimistically, it is possible, as I prefer, to view this in a positive sense, that this reaction is only due to the success in the fostering of increased understanding good relations that has been built between the communities. And therefore, we are a target, as illegitimate a target as we are. And that is why, despite the headwinds and challenges, which we do not shy away from, I continue to find the work of the ASPJ and civil organisations so empowering and motivating. It is the work that we do at grassroots, communal and high level governmental and diplomatic level that is very much on the front line. The ASPJ is one example of how by a focus on what we share in common and the benefits of cooperation, we are all better off. Given COVID constraints, in the past two years, the ASPJ has pivoted to hosting online webinars and events like so many other organisations. Some of our recent guests and events and topics include Jewish Poland and its role in the Ukrainian refugee crisis with Polish Chief Rabbi Michael Shudry, Israel and Poland, against their enemies, with former Poland Ambassador to Israel, Agnieszka Magic majewska and a panel discussion from representatives of the Marek Edelman Dialogue Centre, Guardians of Memory Association and Hakoach regarding Jewish Lodge today. And also, <coughs> Luckiest Jew in Poland, with Michael Rubenfeld, founder and director of Festivals. Recordings of these, plus more webinars, are available for view on our website, polishjews.org.au and our YouTube channel, ASPJ. The ASPJ also produces a newsletter, Haint, three times a year, featuring news and articles of interest and relevance under the masterful production of Izzy Mamour, a life member of the ASPJ, who is nice to see here today with his wife, Etty. The ASPJ also bestows this Henry Swabik Award upon an individual who contributes to a greater understanding of the unique and dynamic contribution by the Polish Jewish community to the all-embracing all -embracing Polish culture and ethos. It is dedicated in memory of the great Polish diplomat, politician and humanitarian, Henry Swabik, who saved several thousand Jews between 1940 and 1944 and was subsequently murdered by the Nazis in Mauthausen. Our 2021 honoree late last year was author Arnold Zabel. Recent pre-bid recipients include Nasli Suleiman MP and Marian Public of the PCCB. 
After a couple of years gap since our last 2019 ASPJ oration featuring Professor Darius Dollar, former director of the Poly Museum, it is with great excitement that the 2022 ASPJ oration will again be held in September this year, featuring Darius Popilia, Polish kayaking champion and founder of the People Not Numbers organisation which preserves the memory of lost Jewish communities. Look out for details of this event and look forward to seeing you there. One of the great strides the ASPJ has made in the past two years is expanding our New South Wales footprints. Through the efforts of our New South Wales board members, Estelle Rozinski, Karen Pakula and Lucy Tusker, we have joined myself, Andrew Reicher, Eva Lissane, Lena Fishman and Peter Schnell, the ASPJ has launched in New South Wales. And today, we in Melbourne are the beneficiaries of this. And he taught the Canaries to sing, was successfully launched at the Polish Consulate in New South Wales. After going online, it was then shown again to a wider audience at the Sydney Jewish Museum. And is now with great pleasure, it's been brought to Melbourne. And he taught the Canaries to sing, is the production of ASPJ Vice President Estelle Rozinski. Estelle is an educator, multimedia artist and curator who has spearheaded the Visual Arts Branch of Sydney's Sheer Madness Jewish Music Festival. Estelle is passionate about exploring Polish Jewish life before 1939. This passion led to the creation of her interactive exhibition, The Missing Mzuzov of Zdanska Bola, the town of her great-grandparents. This exhibition is now on permanent display in the Historical Museum of Zdanska Bola, where over 1,000 Polish schoolchildren so far have visited and engaged with this exhibit, learning about the lives and contribution of Jews in their region. And he taught the Canaries to sing is the most recent evolution of this concept of illuminating pre-war Polish Jewish life. And it is a great thrill for me to welcome Estelle on this stage to commence. everybody to this afternoon's event and especially welcome to Monica with whom this event probably would never have happened. Mm -hmm. And the consulate in Sydney provided the seed funding. Seed funding is always the most difficult stage of any, any project at any time anywhere. So it was very much appreciated and that working tip that we, that we created together was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. There are many people in the audience today who have contributed in different ways, but mostly by way of support, emotional, psychological, because this project is really our project. This project is for all of us. This project is for our children and for many generations I hope to come. But meanwhile, I have another job to do. I am, it is with great pleasure that I am about to introduce two wonderful women who probably need very little introduction to all of you, but to some of you who may be from Sydney or from, who may not be that closely connected to our community, I will just give you a very brief overview of what could be a very long introduction. These two talented women need, no, need little if no introduction to this audience. They have much in common. Both began performing as children and grew up in the Yiddish-speaking world with love and respect for Yiddish theatre. In 2011, together with Evelyn Crape, they formed the Yiddish theatre group Zapdik. Their piece Ekveld was performed to critical acclaim in Montreal, Melbourne and New York. Alyssa Gray performed with Barikovsky and Barikovsky's Guild Wool Theatre in the Dibbuk as Brent and the Wilderness in Melbourne, Sydney and Canberra. Most recently, she was cast in the Opera of Australia production of Fiddler on the Roof. Kind of happened. She continues to perform Yiddish songs cabaret style around Melbourne and I suggest you get into whatever newspaper will advertise it and find her. As you will see today, she has a splendid voice. Tommy Kalinsky returned from a boy and taught English, music and piano in 1980. She is the founding member of the successful cabaret, cabaret group, The Hot Babies, of whom there are many scattered in the audience. <laughs> Where Barry Humphrey spotted her and invited her to become her, his musical director. She's renowned for her roles in 
Tears Before Bedtime and her role in Yiddish theatre. She continues to make a significant impact as a performer, composer, translator and educator. So without further ado, I invite both Tommy and Elisabeth. everyone and thank you so much for having us today. Uh, we will be doing a few little songs now and a few more at the end. Uh, the first song that we're going to do is called Yiddle Midden Fiddle, words by the beloved Yiddish poet Itzik Munger and music by Abe Elstein. It was written for a film of the same name starring the very famous Molly Picon. Speak Yiddish, you still know this song. Uh, from the operetta Shalamis, written in 1880 by Abraham Goldfaden, the founder of modern Jewish Yiddish theatre. Oh, yeah. 
und wärst in dem euch verdienen viel Geld. Und als du wärst, wären reich in der Welt, wärst sind der Morgen in dem Liederlehr. Rosch in Käs mit Mandeln, das wird sein dein Baum. Now I'll lift it up a little. <laughs> We're going to be performing Abi Gesund, written in 1939. This song was a tremendous hit from the film Mamele and became Molly Picon's theme song. Music by A. Belstein, there's that name again, and lyrics by Molly Picon.
and those stories were very difficult to retrieve. Uh, Barbara Kirschenbach Gimbert talks about it in her father's book and her father, Mayor July, said that when he sat in the steam rooms of Canada, of Canada in their hometown, he said that when he sat with survivors, didn't matter whether they were talking about sex, whether they were talking about business, whether they were talking about um, the football, things always came back to the Second World War. It was not possible for them to sustain long conversations about the time that was lost. And it seemed to me that that time was exactly the time that was important for us to know about. So this project aims to retrieve some of those stories. But in the retrieval, it means that those stories are often very short or just vignettes. So you'll find that some of the animations will be tiny, but they nonetheless tell a moment of history in a family somewhere on another continent on another time. So of these six animations, five belong to this community. Two of the stories are mine. Two of the stories belong to the Blitzflower family, to David and to Helena, who are both here today. So thank you for those stories. To Aaron, who is in, living in my place in Sydney, <laughs> Uh, in the rain, and to my own family, to Jane Corman, who interviewed her father, Adolik Cohen, with my, who was my father's best friend growing up, two six-year-old boys in the city of Woolwich, who created a life and had, were very naughty. The other story belongs to my mother, Sula, and tells about her relationship with her older brothers. Uh, the, the title of this project comes from Helena's and David's story and he taught the canaries to sing and was my stop moment where I understood momentarily and immediately that the lives of our parents were ordinary and extraordinary, impoverished and very rich, some in different ways, metaphorically and literally. And and he taught the canaries to sing when you see it, because it's going to be the first animation, you'll understand what an extraordinary life that was. And ne never mind the financial poverty, that the enrichment and the souls of people that lived in abject poverty was often very much richer than what we see today. Um, there are three artists, one of whom has travelled from Sydney with me to be here, Stephen Durbach. <laughs> Alice Lester, with whom this project began, who's not here today, I'm sorry. We'll talk about her work, which is astonishingly wonderful as well. And David Asherbrook, who is another accomplished artist living in Sydney. Um, they have created a world which is rich for the eyes and good for the soul. The musical accompaniment for three of Steve's pieces was composed at by Fen Belling, a jazz musician here in Sydney, and well known to some of you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is really confusing for me. This, I, I'm not even going to go there. Just call it a senior moment, sorry. Here in Melbourne. Um, and Fen Belling, sadly, well, lucky for her, but she's in Sydney at the moment, so you can understand the confusion. People are moving between the cities all the time. Um, the soundtrack to David's second animation was made by him and is just percussion and live music. And his first <coughs> animation, which we're about to see, uh, is his Hannah, uh, Ash, Hannah Brook playing with, um, with David uh, and Egon from Shabbat. So they're very, that's pretty much what you're going to see this evening. We're about to witness the result. I'm just going to read you now the short story that comes before this animation. And he taught the canaries to sing is from the stories of Mendel Blutblau, as told to his daughter Helena. Mendel's father, David Le Blitzblau, his namesake here in the audience, lived in Bawuti, the most impoverished part of Woods with his wife, Haya Frumet, and their children. Family legend 
as that he was very, very tall, and high from it, very, very small. As poor as they were, theirs was a house full of joy, their window sill full of exotic cacti propagated by Duvet. Unusually, their kitchen wall was adorned with musical instruments, all of which Duvet had taught himself to play. Duvet was blessed with a beautiful voice and was the local chazan, the official singer in the synagogue. On rehearsal nights, people huddled in the narrow streets of Bawuti, below his window, to listen to him practice for the next Shabbat or the next holidays. But by far his most exotic skill was training his canaries to sing. How did he do this? He fashioned tiny whistles of different sizes and place them carefully into their water bottles. So without further ado, here it is. While we wait, I will just read you a little bit about David Asher Brooks' um, background as an artist. So David Asher Brook is an Australian visual artist working in painting, tapestry and video art. He has been a four times finalist in the New South Wales Parliament Plein Air Painting Prize, a finalist in the Blake, in the Salon de la Refuse, Paddington Art Prize and the Brett Whiteley Travelling Art Scholarship. Um, and he is also the recipient of the 2010 Waverley Art Oil Painting Prize and the Eva Breuer Memorial Prize. So as you can see, he is a really accomplished artist and he's a name to watch as his star rises. He's been involved in many wonderful projects. You good to go? poked and tied through the bottoms. Hours of hilarious conversation were had in this way. On another occasion, the boys gift wrapped an empty box in exquisite paper and tied a barely visible thread to it. They placed it on the street and the boys disappeared behind a fence and hung on to the thread. There they stayed and peered through a hole while passers-by leant to pick up the box, convinced they had discovered a long-lost treasure. With a small tug of the thread, the box moved and sent the terrified passers-by running back into the street. That animation always makes me laugh because I always know who the Polish people are in the audience. <laughs> And for those of us who know how to swear in Polish, yeah, also. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stephen Durbach, my friend, is here from Sydney, is an artist who works at the interface of art and science, having been in his former life a scientist. He loves drawing, but is sometimes compelled to make eccentric machines to understand or embody the phenomena he is interested in. 
He's exhibited work and performed work at UMSW, CSIRO, and the Science Gallery here at the University of Melbourne in Melbourne. This next animation was his first foray into our, I guess, our work together as curator, animator, and friend. My mother's old, this is from the stories of Sara Zlodogorsky, my mother. My mother's oldest brother, Eliyahu, was a brilliant, burly, and cheeky fellow who loved to tuck his two sisters, Sara and Paula, under his arms and spin. Mm -hmm. On one occasion, my mother had made an elaborate and colourful rooster cutout, which she had left at school. On that day, the school caught fire. Eliyahu couldn't bear to watch his little sister cry, so he flew into the flames and retrieved the rooster. Once a month, it was Eliyahu's job to clean the pendulums of the fa fa family grandfather clock. Somehow, he managed to convince Sarah that she was required to stand in the body of the clock so that it wouldn't topple over. <laughs> she loved him anyway. Stories of Natan Blickblau as told to him, to Aaron Blickblau, his son, and they lived at Shiratska 13. This story is very special to me because it talks about the town of Stranskabola, the town of my great grandparents, and where all of my mother's older siblings have been born. It was a town of 30,000 people in 1937 and had approximately 12,000 Jews living there. Some were extremely rich while others lived in abject poverty. The, count, the kindness of the town was legendary. On Friday afternoons, the townspeople arrived at the bakers with their pots of chulant, a type of stew. One's relationship with the baker was particularly important mm -hmm. because he knew where the critical and the best place was for your chulant for that show. Mm -hmm. He didn't like you, you were going to get burnt chillant or undercooked chillant. If you were his mate, you had prime location in that oven. So, hold that thought. On Saturday midday, all the Jewish children of the town came to pick up their family pot. There was an understanding in the town that you wouldn't always get your own pot back. Every now and then, a poor family might pick up your pot, and for that Sabbath, that family ate well. It was also understood the following week you would get your pot back. Mm -hmm. So probably you didn't eat well for two weeks. Mm -hmm. But it was very well understood that the poverty in the town was life-threatening, probably. So I know this story to be true because when I met with one of the other descendants from Strenskavolo in Jerusalem, I, while I was recounting the story, he, 
finished the story for me and I was astonished. And I said, how did you know that story? He said, I know because my family was the poor family. Mm -hmm. The next part is part of the Passover story. And it's particularly important because it follows a similar thread in terms of solidarity and community. At the time, every, at every Seder, many of you know, you open the door to it, Elijah the prophet so that he'll come and get wine. In this instance, in Strinska Bola, the doors were open for Elijah, but they're actually open for the poor, who would arrive at the Seder dressed as ghosts, not to be embarrassed by their poverty, they're incognito, but then they sat at the table and they ate of the Passover meal. So this animation by Stephen is quite short, but very beautiful and recounts the moment of the ghosts. Thank you for coming. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We just gotta let these guys be free. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Who are you? Why are you here? Uh, uh, I was the last animation. <laughs> so Stephen, yes. what was your initial response to this project when I approached you? Um, I actually had a very really carefully um, thought out answer, which I never would remember when I came out. <laughs> but, um, but basically, I was um, the most I was very compelled because I'd always love to work with you. I'm a big go back quite a way now. So I was excited that you invited me to, to do an animation. And then I was also slightly like a bit nervous about it because um, I realized my history is quite different from your history. I mean, my, my family, I, I have no sort of, um, you know, stories of the Holocaust for one thing in my family and we came from Lithuania, lived in South Africa, which is clear from my accent, and arrived here and then, you know, so, so my history is very different, but um, I was very curious actually, because I'm by nature, that's what, if I feel curious about something, that's when I want to do it, and I thought, what actually happens if I don't have a, a specific connection to the history, but, and, you know, there is a connection, you know, my, obviously my Jewish history, what actually happens if you don't have a specific connection to a history? but you allow your imagination to go down a certain pathway. And that's the one really nice thing about animation is that um, animation is very much, it evolves. So I wanted to see what happens if you just allow it to evolve, what stories emerge without having too much access to the actual content. So, and I think what was really interesting is that I noticed by the second, by this, actually the Seder, I'd gone up a bigger scale. And then I felt like I'd really actually gone into that world. Like I, it was a big scale, it was almost like walking into the drawing. 
and I felt like I was actually there. I was seeing my own self to some extent, but also families that I feel like I knew. I didn't feel like I was drawing characters. I felt like I was actually somehow just embodying or making people that were there somehow just materialize. That's what it felt like. It was a really um, emotional experience. There are a couple of things that come up for me with your answer. One is that you talk about scale. So maybe could you talk a little bit about the process of your first animation and how it changed from the first to the second animation? I can. I can talk about that. Um, so, so the first one, I, I was basically... The first question I had to ask myself is, can I animate? <laughs> That's the first, because I, I, I don't really have experience animating. So, uh, I think the first project was a bit more tentative, and I also, because I have a scientific background, I can't help myself, I have to try and understand the principle behind something. So, once I got my head around that, and that principle was really beautiful, because it tied in very well for my artistic process, and that's about evolution. And animation is the perfect embodiment of an evolutionary process, because it's one generation, the next drawing is another generation, and every generation is a subtle variation between the generation before. That's what an animation is. And that's like life. I mean, life is literally an animation where this moment now is affected by the moment just before it. So it's a beautiful metaphor for life, and it, it does evolve, but somehow by my hand. Um, so once I got that around, I thought, okay, I could do animation because it's just really science. Um, and, then, and then the second animation, basically what changed was, as I said, the scale went bigger, and I was much more comfortable, and I think the intuition was stronger. The intuition, I just said, right, uh, I don't have to overthink this now, I've kind of got what this is and I can just go big and just allow the more visceral uh, intuition to take over and direct the story. And that's really what I think what happens is because, as I said, that scale really just invites you in. And, and, and once you're in that world, you have to follow through and, and see where it goes. There were two, there, so there's two things. So the first animation was created on tracing paper. And layers and layers. How many drawings do you think you did for that first animation? I mean, I think there were about 320 or so. Just to give you an no, idea. No, 390 to be specific. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's... The level of labour intensity. And the repetition and the ongoing. And there's a safety, okay? When you're working on tracing paper and you're creating 390 drawings, you actually can go back and refer. So you can cross-reference as well which is really helpful. But the second process, yeah. can you talk about, just talk, tell the audience well, how big when you talk about scale. I mean, scale, um, it was about that tall. <laughs> which is not really, about a metre and a half, I guess. But actually, you know, if, Square. I think, if I think about that first animation, it's a weird thing because, you know, when you can go back, it's a really interesting metaphor for going back in history as well. So having all those layers, somehow actually having them physically exist, and it's actually one of the philosophical models of time, like the block theory of time says that time still exists now as much as this moment exists now. So it's really interesting philosophically, and, uh, but the second animation is a bit more like how we understand time, where it's just this linear progression of moments, and once you work in this moment, the previous moment is obliterated. You know, you cannot go back to it, it no longer exists. So that's, it's, a, it's, you know, it, it's interesting how the process lends itself to the metaphor of what, of what you're working on. Yeah, and I think that the metaphor is very interesting because you yourself articulated changes that happened within yourself and how the Holocaust had presented itself as not being a child of survivors as many of us are in this room, how it presented itself for you. So do you want to just for one, two sentences talk to that? Well, I think having such a different history, it's such a difficult place to go, you know. And I, I was a bit worried that because I, I had to move through it, you know, as part of this process to go back in time. You have to move this thing which is so massive in any Jew's life. It's, it's unavoidable. When I'm directly you know, I'm very much involved. And so I, had, I knew I had to move through that. And I was a little worried that the colouring of my work would be affected by that. And I'm not convinced that it wasn't. You know, like, it, it, that... that that history is there, you had to move through it. Now oh, that is, you know, it becomes part of, you know, it's, it's, it's there even though it wasn't there, if, if that makes any sense. Totally. And for me as a curator, that was one of the really big difficult moments for us in creation, in creating these animations, was getting somebody who would be able to see the animation as freshly as an 
uncontaminated by the horrors of a war, but to be able to present to you something that was vital and dynamic, that had no notion or sense of what was about to happen. So that was one of the challenges for me as the curator. Um, and the final question for you, Steve, is the music. Talk to us about the music. Well, the music was one of those really uh, serendipitous things, which is just amazing. Uh, because I did the first animation and I suddenly realised that it needs sound. I mean, it, it, it's probably obvious to anybody who does works with animations that they should come with a soundtrack of sorts. But I wasn't thinking about the sound. I'm not a musician. I don't really think about sound. And sound has a very specific aesthetic. And um, so I was, the, so our process was, it was uh, pretty clum clumsy. I, I, I tried to find some klezmer music I thought might fit, and it just doesn't. You know, when you take two different things, stick them together, it's clear that you've just shoved one thing on top of the other, and it looks like you did that. But then this, uh, let's call it a miracle. Um, my cousin, I happen to, I married wisely. Because um, <laughs> my cousin by marriage is, is Femme Belling, and actually her uncle's right there at the back. Uncle Stan is Hello, the back there representing the family. <laughs> She was visiting, uh, and she's an extremely accomplished violinist and jazz singer. And, and she happened to be visiting, and, I, and um, she, was, she came, I, I invited her into my studio, I said, I'm working on this, and perhaps you'd be interested in composing, uh, seeing if you can come up with some sort of composition to it. And she just stood there with her electric violin, her cell phone, which I'm not sure what she was doing with that, but it somehow was a necessary component, and started playing, and then... Uh, Two takes later, she had the composition, and so and and what I loved about it, it you know, she's um, her history is also tied into my history. So some in some way, I was looking at a history that wasn't mine, and she was reflecting on her history that was part of my history that wasn't hers. <laughs> but somehow, it made this I think really beautiful whole, and, and and subsequently to that, so any project I now do with animation, and I think it'd be now three stuff after that, and uh, I just. Finish and I send it to Fen, and she, I said, you do what you need to do, and then she sends it back, and it's it's always perfect, in my humble <laughs> estimation. <laughs> so that's the story. Thank you. Of the music. So this we, we're about to see Steve's third animation, which is actually longer. It has a narrative, and it's from another member of the community from you who lives in the United States, from Springs Kabbalah as well. Um, but you changed your process quite dramatically with this one, and do you want to just talk to that to, to, for two seconds? And I okay, I'll talk to you very quickly about that. I mean, basically what I've come to realise is that the process of repetition that I discovered in the first animation, where it's generation upon generation, is really an iterative dance. And I tried to basically do that. So when I did the third animation, it was also a big scale, but I didn't want to think at all. I wanted to go in there, do, uh, draw and paint for like a limited amount of time, so there's no thinking involved. I wanted intuition to completely drive the process and almost be like a choreography where you're just moving backwards and forwards between the camera click and the and the and the drawing surface. And then and then only evaluating after the session of the day whether that worked at all. Which is very uh, you know it's you, there's a lot of trust involved and I think a part of the process and part of what Estelle and I <laughs> was this idea of trust. And look, I think we have a history together where there's trust, but it, it does create certain moments of nervousness when I told her, this is how I'm doing it. I'm not thinking at all. I'm just going backwards and forwards. Obviously, with the story uh, being the cornerstone of, of that being in my mind, but not wanting to direct the minutiae of it with uh, too much thinking. So that's, I'd say... I will just tell you that each frame... How many frames would there be? Oh, there would be 700 to 800. Okay, yeah. each frame was done in 30 seconds. Yeah. Alright, I just want to share that with you. <laughs> I want to share my nervousness with you just a little bit. Okay. So. Yeah, you have no control and you have to actually give control up, which is a really fascinating process. <laughs> yeah, for him and for me. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, Steve. No that better. was really... So this story is about the father's yard. So in Street Skabola there was a large property, a large compound that was owned by the Rosenzoff family. 
and the whole family lived there and the whole compound was dedicated to the different processes of dyeing, of dyeing fabric and dyeing wool. And this story was told to me by Harry Ross, who now lives, who lives in the United States. Imagine, if you will, <coughs> excuse me, a place where multiple generations of a once loved, ooh, place where multiple generations of a large, once large <clears throat> European family lived, worked and played together in a family compound. <clears throat> the father's yard was a place just like that at 21 Rusker Street in a small Polish town of Swinskavol, not too far from Lodge. The Rosenzak family, Harry's family, lived there from the late 1800s until 1939. The compound was impressive for its time. As well as being a place of work, there were several homes, horses, stables, apple trees and even a pond. Music often filled the air as several family members played musical instruments in their spare time. Living and working together led to a rich and engaging life. Everyone had the opportunity to learn from the elders, share meals and share the holidays. The head of the family business, Harry's grandfather, was affectionately known as the father, the master dyer, a title which was passed on to those who followed. The father ran the business together with his partners other members of the family and led the social life of all families living and working together. The family operated their business dyeing fabric and yarns which were then sorted, stacked on horse-drawn wagons and transported to the textile heart of Poland, the factories of the city of Lodz. Everyone, the children as well, had chores to do in and around their homes and the compound, but the children were adored and the adults changed their work into a game. Harry's grandfather sang to the children as they lay, lined up from youngest to oldest and passed the piles of red fabric from hand to hand until it reached the wagons where they were stacked in neat red piles, then blue, then yellow and then brown, as if it was a game, all of them singing together all the while.
animation students. This final animation was created by David Asherbrook. It's entitled The Healer because it's a little known fact that even in downtown Svenskabola, more than a hundred years ago, you could be a healer or a naturopath. And so was my great grandmother, a naturopath, and the village wise woman. These are some of the stories of my mother, Sarah Zlotogorska. And every winter, Sarah went by train with her two younger brothers, Momek and Pinoš, to visit their grandparents in the Polish town of Zrenskabola. When they arrived, they were taken by horse and carriage, crackety clack, over the cobblestone streets to their grandparents' home on Stonzitska Oshin, Stonzitska 8. Idel, Sarah's grandfather, greeted her with his tickly red beard, which made Sarah giggle as he kissed her hello. The household was loving and warm. On Shabbos morning, Sarah woke to warm milk and cake heating on the child's oven. In the dark evenings, Grandpa Adele always lost her cards and made her laugh before kissing her goodnight. It took her a while before she worked out and was really pretending to lose. Mm -hmm. Among the guests in the Hanukkah household was Sarah's first cousin, Fanya. Fanya was a very good looking girl who liked to check her appearance and her deportment as she, by placing a mirror strategically in front of herself at the dinner table. <laughs> Sarah and her cousin Fania squabbled a great deal, particularly at bedtime, as they had to share a bed. Their squabble spilled into the bedroom and Grandpa Idel had a unique way of separating them. He placed a single row of straw down the centre of the bed with a stern warning that neither girl was to cross the border. <laughs> Hannah, Sarah's grandmother, was a naturopath and had a small garden of herbs planted at the back of the wooden outhouses. Their courtyard had the best water in town for the ring tea. Kathunk squeak, kathunk squeak. The pump went day and night. On Friday afternoon before Shabbat, the neighbours queued with their pots and pans in a long snake chatting and arguing as they waited to draw water from the, for their urns and pots. Mm. Hannah knew how to heal people with her creams and potions. Sarah watched and helped with the making of the salad, sometimes using water and pestle. And they came to Sarah from near and far, both Jew and Gentile. Hannah had the magic touch. She knew how to massage newborn babies' hips into place. One morning, Unable to find a doctor on a Sunday, the desperate parents of a young boy with a dislocated elbow arrived on her doorstep. With a quick flick and tug, she relocated his elbow. The following Monday, Hannah had a call from the doctor threatening her with a lawsuit that never eventuated. Thank you, Hannah. You might need to turn up the sound because I'm a bit percussion.
that. Um, we come to the next part of the afternoon, and that's the in conversation moment with Francis Prince. Prince. Francis Prince is a Jewish educator and community stalwart. She's involved in many Jewish community organisations. She is an executive member of the Jewish Community Council of Victoria, JCCV, where she holds the multicultural interfaith portfolio. In this capacity, she represents the community of a, on a number of interfaith boards. She's also the Vice President of the Australian Jewish Historical Society of Victoria, and she has recently published her first book, Gift of Time, Discoveries from the Daily Ritual of Reading with My Father. I'm particularly impressed by that new book because to sit and to interview and to draw out stories is one of the most difficult and challenging moments in time. To actually be able to hear sensitively, to draw out what's important, to let go to the keep of what you think may not be important, but to fashion together something that's a composite of a really successful book, I think is quite a remarkable feat. I'd like to congratulate Francis and bring her to the stage. Stay tuned for the next book. I think there's one on the way. Um, I want to delve deeper into some of the points that you made in your introduction. And then I want to go back to basics, is why? Why is this been important for you to curate, or to create, to commission, and to curate this very, very ambitious artistic project? There are so many reasons. You that echo through your life. Um, I think one of the first of them is where both of us have parents who were disturbed by the fact that their lives were often not represented in mainstream. So if I look at my mother's story, so she had five siblings, each of them had a different story and each of them had a different personality. Mainstream post-war was really fairly uniform of what was what had been left behind. So we were often influenced by the photographs of Vishniak or the photographs of people who had managed to hide information. And in fact, they didn't give the broad picture. So in the case now, today we're listening to klezmer music, that's sort of part of our lives really, but it represented one part of music in the total Polish picture. So certainly our families enjoyed Polish literature, Polish music in many of its different forms. So in my mother's family, her oldest brother was a larrikin. He was, he was naughty and at the age of 14 took himself off to join the merchant marines. So there he was on a ship, the shocked, I guess the shocked sailors hauled him off the boat, took him to the Polish police and he was brought home to my parents, my grandparents, so covered in lice. So that's not what you generally hear about. Then her second brother was a Zionist and he did Hashara, so he did preparation for moving to Israel in his family's home. So he was a Zionist. My mother's older sister was a communist and she was often running off to different May Day marches and was smuggled out of the windows of her grandparents' house by my mother. <laughs> my mother, who never told, was the goody goody two shoes and protected her a great deal, but she always did what the parents said. Momek was a very talented academic who knew how to recite the Kumash from a very early age, and the baby Pinush was the family comedian. So, just in one family, you can see how diverse we were as a nation, how unhomogeneous we were as people and as individuals. Like, if you consider that. Melbourne has, what, 100,000? And if you multiply that by whatever it takes to get to 3 million, you're going to have a lot of very diverse people. So that was one of the things that bothered my parents, or my mother in particular. The other thing that bothered her was that she spoke a perfect Polish. 
She was not brought up with Yiddish in home. She, in fact, she practiced her Yiddish when she moved to Melbourne after the war. So my mother was brought up on all of those times. She was brought up on Mitzkevich. She was brought up on Yulian Tuvin, who incidentally was a Jew living in Lodge, whose poetry is still practiced and learned by Polish school children today. All of those things that were not known and were actually true to their environments. So I think that's one of the really important points. Another really important point is to reclaim our history. The catastrophe of the Holocaust had to be remembered and memorialised, but in so doing, it overshadowed the ordinariness of our everyday life. You know, the going to the great-grandparents, the going to Salado night dinner, what happened at Passover, all of those stories that are really so important and fashion a child's life and fashion a child's history, are required. those things were missing for our children. And I think what is really important is to, what was important to this project and with this project was to send gossamer threads over the abyss and say, hey, wait a minute, you guys, you actually had a real and true history. You did have great-grandparents. You did have grandparents. You did have people who told you stories. You did have those things. And we want to reintroduce them to you in some way, in whatever way we can, by retrieving those stories for our kids. So in doing so, we could present a history that is bright, that could coexist with the Holocaust. So not to overshadow because you could never do that. But there is another story and we do need to hear that other story and we do need to share that other story with our children but also with the broader community because who are the people that the world turned their back on, that the world decided had no right to live? They were ordinary people like all of us here in this room. In one moment, in one turn, one flip of a dime, everything was shattered and all of those things lost. Okay, thank you for um, that depth of understanding um, of your motivation and your thinking and your vision for the project. So I think we now have a sense of the why. So I'd like to move from where did you go from the why to the how? So you have this vision, you have this sort of idea. Um, how did you go from that to the actual concept that we've all been privileged to see this afternoon. Um, in other words, I guess, what was the genesis of the actual vision? How did you get to what we've seen? Well, that's, re that's a really interesting question because as an artist and a practitioner and as an educator, there's really an aha moment. There's really a moment we go, yep, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. There's often a zigzagging between different ideas and concepts and ideas. And I think as educators, you often look at what you're trying to achieve and you're evaluating, you're recalibrating, thinking, oh, that's not quite working, this isn't quite working. So a lot of these ideas that I talked about in the why were things that, that reverberated through my life. There were, you know, there were questions that niggled me. And what happened was, was fairly serendipitous. My cousin was very closely involved with the town of Strinskavola through a family genetis, a genealogist, not geneticist, geneticist, that's him, <laughs> by the name of Dr. Camilla Klazinska. And I was really impressed with what he was telling me about this young Catholic woman from the town of Strinskavola. Here she was, this young woman who had, moved, had, who had discovered essentially our cemetery. She thought it was a magical, mystical garden because nobody knew about the Jewish cemetery of Struinskavola. And the Jewish cemetery of Struinskavola was particularly beautiful. Struinskavola, I'm told, had many, many artists. And the tombstones are all beautifully relief. So you have images of, of urns and you have images of boats and you have images of people and you have images of books and you have images of elk. All of them have very specific meaning, symbolic, metaphoric. So there was this young Polish woman, young girl, skipping through this beautiful park, 
What was it? Who lived here? Who was there? She made herself aware of what that was and she, she found out that it was a Jewish cemetery and together with a man from street, uh, from, descended from Zrinskabola living in Israel, they documented this whole cemetery. They found the tombstones, the Matzevot, they documented what was there, they registered everything and they, they conducted this major work, often bringing in students from Israel. And I'm listening to my cousin talk about this wonderful and welcoming human being who was full of compassion. And I said, how is it possible that this young woman is looking after our sacred spaces and I'm not doing anything? How is, it, how is that so? What can I do that would add to and enhance the story? And I thought, I can get the stories of the town, of the people from before the war, because all of you are of that town, not of that town, but of that country, and we have the stories. So there began the project called The Missing Mezuzot of Strinskavola, and that project, as Ezra said, exists today in the town of Strinskavola, and a thousand children have interacted with that, that interactive exhibition. So, that was part of the story. Having done that exhibition, <coughs> I looked at what I could then extract from that that would be useful in another mode. What were the things that really worked? What were the things that worked? A little bit less. And how could I recalibrate that exhibition to make it more meaningful for, it, for more children in more places or more adults in more places? And in fact, there is another step from there to where we are today, which is really the third incarnation, there's the Glass Flower Project. And the Glass Flower Project is hopefully ongoing, but was rudely interrupted by COVID. So that's still on hold, so that, that's coming, that's going to happen, and that's going to be very big. I hope it's going to be in Krakow during the Cultural Festival, but it'll be in Festivalt which is the fringe part of the Krakow Festival, which has gone on for 30 years, 31 years this year. So the third incarnation actually happened as a result of my interaction with Anita Lester. So Anita Lester and I met through Yoav, her brother, who happened to be in Poland at the same time as me, and I dragged him to the Krakow Cultural Festival. Anyway, he said I needed to meet his sister, which I did, and Anita, and I decided that it would be a wonderful idea, I think this idea was actually Anita's, that we should create a beautiful book. One side should be the stories, the documented stories that we were collecting, and the other side should be illustrated or painted by very famous Australian artists. She had some connections, I had some connections, and I loved the idea. I thought, great, let's do it. As it happened, I was studying at university and I took the project to my lecturer, COVID had happened, and my lecturer looked at me and said, no, 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 why don't you do a live illustration? What's a live illustration? I said, she said, no, what you do is, let's look at the idea of my mother and the grandfather clock. You would paint the picture of the grandfather clock, but then you would animate the time or the pendulum is my poor mum in the mirror body of the cop. But you would animate one part of the picture. I took that concept back to Anita and she said, much, much easier to animate the whole thing. Mm. So that was, that was the kernel of the idea. I took that then to my lecturer and she, I said, I'm going to do animations. And we had to also write a grant for this particular part of the university process. And I thought, no. Nah, I've been in this game too long. I'm not writing grants with no purpose anymore. I'm going to write a grant application and I'll do it to Waverley Council and maybe I'll send it to the Polish consulate in Sydney. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I wanted to do was to engage a Polish animator because I happen to love Polish graphics. I grew up on beautiful Polish books. Those of you who've had the privilege of having those storybooks in your home know that Polish graphic artists are, to my mind, almost second to none. So I really wanted to engage a Polish animator and I really wanted to engage a Jewish animator. 
That was the moment that I ran for Monica. Monica, excuse me, is the, is the Consul General here so this afternoon. And Monica said, I said, Monica, do you know of any Polish animators? And she said, no, but I will work. I will think about it and I will get back to you in a week, which she did. But she also said, why don't you flip me or send me your project and your proposal? So after a week, I contacted Monica, and please excuse my familiarity. Yeah, this is okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and, um, and Monica said, listen, I don't know a Polish animator, I've looked and I've tried, but we will sponsor the project. And that's why we're actually here today. So that's how it came to be. And what then happened was serendipitous. Not only did the Polish consulate sponsor these animations, but they sponsored a very beautiful function, which we worked on together. So we had music. Pardon? After it was in between. In between, yeah. We between had one, <laughs> it was a window of opportunity in Sydney where you could go. You could actually engage people. So we had the next generation of Jewish children and survivors who performed, who sang in Polish and in Hebrew and in English. We had the beginning, the first four of these animations. One of them was an emergency animation. That was Steve Sader was an emergency animation. That's another story. And we had, I recited a poem by, by Julian Tuvim in Polish, which was very scary, but I did it and I translated it, and it was really a very beautiful and successful evening. On the strength of that, Conrad Quitt, who was in the audience, said to me, I cannot believe what you've done. I think, I thought that the history books were everything, but I see now that art is really important. What you've presented for us is critical and engages everybody. On the strength of that, he championed the project the Sydney Jewish Museum, which then was meant to be live but went online. So COVID was the next critical bit that we went online, which made this project accessible to everybody. So, yeah. Okay, I'd like to explore a little bit more about the artists. It's like you met Anita Lester, and it's a, that's a coincidence. But continuing on from that, actually, how did you find, Steve, David, how did you find the animators and the artists? And what I mean by find is really, what were you looking for? What were the qualities of the artist um, that you wanted to really give the responsibility for these creations? And also, again, you talked about a little bit with Steve, is once you found them, what was the relationship between you? It's not just someone, a curator, coming in and commissioning a piece of work. You were yourself an artist. So what was that relationship? So it's a two-part question. What did, sort of person, what sort of artist were you looking for and how did you work with them? It was really hard. Well, first of all, there were, there were financial restrictions, all right? So to create an animation is hugely expensive. So that was the first thing. Um, getting funding was another thing. And what I knew, I knew what I didn't want. I didn't want a cartoon. I really didn't want a cartoon. I didn't want to in any way diminish our history or our story. Um, so that was the next thing. And I didn't know if I wanted somebody of my background. Was that going to be really important to be Jewish? Was it important to be not Jewish? Was it important to be Polish? Was it important to be not Polish? In the way, what happened was really serendipitous. There was I had to make a decision because I had a deadline. We ha I had made a commitment to create these animations by a certain time for the, for the consulate. We had an event. And I thought the only thing I can do is to work with the artists I really trust and I know. And I have a very strong working relationship, personal and working with Stephen and with David. We've worked on many projects together and they're used to my curatorial style and that is to throw out an idea and ricochet backwards and forwards ideas and toss them around. So that was really how we worked on things and that's how I made my decision. So it wasn't a hugely clever cerebral decision, it was how things work. 
Thank you. Thank you, Estelle. My last question is, where do we go from here? What is your next step? What does this lead to? What is happening? So what I would really like is to do a call out to all of you for your stories. Mm -hmm. Do you have a story that you would like to be part of this project? How would you like to be part of this project? Is this something that appeals to you? Is this important to you in any way? And people often say to me, you know, I haven't got a story. I didn't speak to my mother. I don't know. I didn't have an opportunity to speak to my father. But the reality is that there'll be something. It'll be the way that the Friday night prayers happen. It'll be the making of the challah. It will be the setting of the table. It will be the Shabbos prayers, priestly blessings over children. They're there, they're stitched into your life and often you're not aware of what they are, but they require you to think. So what I'm asking you to do on your pieces of paper, there's an email address. If you would like to be part of this project and contribute your story, I would love to hear from you. So that's one. Number two is that I am involved now in getting grant process, the grant process which brings me to my knees, mm -hmm. and looking for philanthropists, which also brings me to my knees. They are difficult chores, and because you might be an artist, doesn't make you good at all the other stuff. The, and the next part of that, that next process is approaching museums. So that is the new Holocaust Museum here in Melbourne. There is Yad Vashem, there is Polin, there is Anu, which is the old Bedat Futsot, which is interested in the story of Jews from around the world. All of those museums really have facility and should be showing these works and encouraging our story. As a community, I'm very proud of all of us because I think you are very tight and very close and you understand many of the things that I understand. It's often hard to engage with other people at, at randomly. Um, and if you can give financial support, large or small, there is also a tax deductible line at the end of your at the end of your page as well. Gelman and words and music by Abe Elstein again. Uh, the song was taught to me by Barry Kosky uh, for the show Esperent, which was the second show in the Gilgal Theatre's Exile Trilogy, which we performed in Melbourne and also in Sydney as part of the Belvoir Theatre season. And it also has a personal meaning for me because I sang it at my wedding. And next month that will be 
pretty at ease. <laughs> okay. Bum 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 
Men som kan sitte et sted på hjelen Leppen når nær og ned Og et mer sen enn de klyge Har på mer av skjene på ned De hjelmer lachen tog en nacht Så det rakt er stiger så ordning Tør så ikke være